When you think about it, in some ways, Superman isn't a very compelling character on his own. He's Superman. He's impervious to bullets. He can fly away from any threat. He can make heat rays come out of his eyes, for God's sake. No, Superman doesn't quite become a compelling character until the introduction of a certain crystalline material known as kryptonite. Once Superman can be rendered unsuper, the stories have even bigger stakes, and the resolution of those stories can be in doubt. Fun tangent, based on my very basic research, thank you Wikipedia, Superman co-creator Jerry Siegel wrote a story during Superman's first couple of years of publication, uh, Superman premiered in 1938, that featured a kind of kryptonite. According to Gerard Jones, author of Men of Tomorrow, Geeks, Gangsters, and The Birth of the Comic Book, the story was rejected because the conceit would have exposed Superman's Clark Kent identity to Lois Lane. Kryptonite finally made its way into the comic books when editor Dorothy Woolfolk felt that, quote, Superman's invulnerability was boring, end quote. And that's what I want to talk about. Regina George uh, is not a full, complete, compelling character in the first act of Mean Girls because she's invulnerable. Same goes for Steven Seagal characters. With one notable exception, he always wins every fight, no matter how hard it is for him to move around. In Jenny B. Jones' In Between, she introduces Katie Parker, a character whose mother is in jail, leaving her to the custody of the state. After six months there, she's put into foster care with Mr. and Mrs. Scott, as Jenny puts it, a squeaky clean family who could have their own sitcom. I found Katie and her story compelling, but why? That's what we're going to discuss in this video. But first, a word from our sponsor, the Oxford comma. That's the comma used after the penultimate item in a list and before the and. You can't ask your sweetie to pick up eggs, milk, and bread without an Oxford comma. They'll come home with eggs and milk and bread. Without the Oxford comma, you'll think that celebrity cook and talk show host Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking her family and her dog. What an awkward and, and lonely Thanksgiving that would be. Oxford commas. Use the promo code Allison Rhodes, one word, to separate items and lists in a manner that isn't confusing. Okay, we're back. The protagonist of Jenny B. Jones's In Between is a young woman named Katie Parker, who is introduced in quite a felicitous manner. She's in the passenger seat on her way to her new foster home. The author slips in the exposition in a wonderfully graceful manner. If you check out Jenny B. Jones's website, which you should, you'll learn that this is only the first book in a series of novels about young Miss Parker. If all of that ink, digital and otherwise, is going to be spilled over a character, then she better be a pretty good one, right? And from the way she's established and in between, Katie is pretty great. But why? Katie is most certainly a strong, independent young woman who can take care of herself as much as anyone else her age can, sure. But like I said with Superman, a character isn't interesting if that's all he or she is. I'm thinking of Veronica Mars, which I do quite a bit. In the pilot episode of that great show, we immediately learn that Veronica is not someone with whom you should mess. She's tough, she's snarky, she's smart, but she also misses her mother uh, and her best friend and is dealing with a lot of pain. Let's take a look at a crucial passage uh, in In Between. After a quick tour of her new foster home, the caretaker, Mrs. Smartly, prepares to leave Katie with her new foster parents. These passages are a little long, but they're lovely, so bear with me. Uh, they're going to be great, except for my voice. Sorry about that. Not much that I can do. I clear my throat. Maybe we could look at the laundry room one more time? Mrs. Smartly cuts her eyes at me. Doesn't it mean anything to the woman that I would rather be in her company? Our guardian reaches for her car keys. Katie, it's time I left. Isn't this the part where she should be crying, delicately wiping her tears on a handkerchief, letting me know how much I will be missed? At this point, I'm even okay with the kind of crying that involves heaving sobs and lots of snot. Come on, Mrs. Smartly. Genuine panic races through me. I'm going to be alone with total strangers, and their dog will probably suffocate me in my sleep tonight or drown me in drool. No, 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 think, must think. Did you pack my switchblade, Mrs. Smartly? Mrs. Smartly doesn't even blink. Millie Scott sure does. No, Katie. I left it back at the home along with your rat poison collection. Mrs. Smartly smiles evenly. Our Katie has quite a sense of humor. Mrs. Scott isn't sure whether to be calmed or not by Mrs. Smartly's indifference. Oh, yeah, Millie Scott. You'd better be scared. You'd better fear this. I am dangerous. I do dangerous, risky, life-threatening things all the time. Oh, who am I kidding? The most dangerous thing I've ever done is sit on a public toilet. Up to this point, Katie has been full of snark. She's never been cruel or unpleasant. She's just acting like a 16-year-old. Talking back mildly to Miss Smartly and hiding behind the facade of strength she has understandably been erecting for years. Again, 100% confidence in strength and victory is boring. But Mrs. Smartly knows the score. 
She knows that Katie is revealing some vulnerability. No one wants to see the laundry room again. But as the adult here, this is Jenny giving Mrs. Smartly some characterization of her own, Mrs. Smartly knows that Katie is just scared and deals with it in a helpful way. After snark and self-confidence, we have perfectly understandable don't leave me from Katie. Slightly irrational fears of being drowned in dog drool. And look at that part. This is my favorite part. Oh yeah, Millie Scott, you better be scared. You better fear this. I am dangerous. I do dangerous, risky, life-threatening things all the time. Oh, who am I kidding? The most dangerous thing I've ever done is sit on a public toilet. In those two paragraphs, Jenny encapsulates Katie's mindset. She acts tough, but acknowledges her vulnerability to herself and to the reader whom she's directly addressing. The next part. Walk me out to the van, Katie. I've got something for you. And with that, Mrs. Smartly shakes hands with my new mom and pop, throws out some final instructions, and pulls me out the door with her. The two of us walk silently down the driveway to the green van. The path stretches before me like some sort of melodramatic symbol of how far I am from home. In this moment, I am overwhelmed with a powerful sadness. I miss my mom, my old trailer house, the stray cats. Right now, I even miss that ugly red-headed kid across the street who threw worms on me. Don't cry. Don't you cry, Katie. Deep breaths now. I don't know if you agree, but crying can sometimes be cliché. It's a very obvious and clear way of expressing a character's emotion, but it can be too easy sometimes. That's why I like the way Jenny handles that next moment. Sm Mrs. Smartly can tell Katie is getting emotional and brings her to a place where they can have a little bit more, little more privacy. Instead of giving us the description of Katie weeping, we get her internal monologue and infer the emotion instead. And what happens next? I drag my feet along the gravel in a deliberately annoying way, which, of course, doesn't faze Mrs. Smartly in the least. Leaning her ample frame into the driver's side of the van, she pulls out a small box. What is it? I say it as if I already cannot stand the gift or her. It's stationary. Stationary? Well, sure, nothing says have a nice life like paper products. Great, thanks, Mrs. Smartly. I don't know why I'm mad, but I am. Maybe I can write the governor and thank him in social services for placing me in the Chihuahua capital of the world. Maybe I'll write Trina and see if she's moved on to nunchucks yet. Or, hey, I know, maybe I'll write Dave Letterman and tell him me and my new dog have a super cool trick we like to call Kill Katie. Mrs. Smartly snorts. And the next thing I know, I'm plastered to her polyester paisley dress, enveloped in my second unsought hug of the day. Katie Parker, you are something else. Mrs. Smartly's chest shakes with her chuckling, and to my utter shame, hot tears fall down my cheeks. Oh, this day will live in infamy. We move apart, and before I can turn my head, she has a tissue in my hand. Iola Smartly, prepared for anything. Clearly, she was a Girl Scout in her youth. Okay, so we do have explicit description of crying here, but Jenny avoids the cliché by making the action secondary. Not only that, the tears are accompanied by some of the humor Katie uses as a defense mechanism. I also love that Mrs. Smartly gives Katie stationery. This is the kind of gift that has a different meaning for adults than it would for a 16-year-old. To a youngster, writing letters is a formality, something you do because you're told. Someone gave you a gift, someone you invited you to a party, you have to thank them. But... Mrs. Smartly knows she's not just giving Katie homework. She's forcing Katie to think and write about her feelings. Okay, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. Mrs. Smartly, I cast a sorrowful look back at the house. Are you sure you want to leave me here? My voice catches and I'm all too aware of the plea in my tone. I expect a wisecrack from Mrs. Smartly, but her face softens and she suddenly gives me something I know I don't ever want from her. Pity. No, Katie Parker, I don't want to leave you here, but I do want to do what's right for you, and just as sure as I know this engine is going to overheat at some point on my way home, I know taking you back with me to Sunnyhaven would be the wrong thing to do. Now I'll be checking on you, so if anything goes wrong, I'll be back. She sees the hope in my puffy eyes. But I don't think that's going to be necessary. Young lady, you have a chance to have a good life. She pokes a stubby finger in my chest. Don't screw this up. The van door gives a mournful creak as it shuts, and Mrs. Smartly starts the reluctant ignition. The van, my green van, slowly backs out of the driveway. I would give in to my urge to chase the vehicle down the driveway, but I'm sure Rocky the Wonder Dog would join the chase and come after me like I'm his latest dog biscuit. Mrs. Smartly slowly breaks the van and rolls down the window. I will miss you, Miss Katie, she calls. You're one of my favorites. I'll miss you too. I'm just blubbering now. 
Again, having a character cry isn't bad in and of itself. What I like about this bit is that the crying has definitely been earned. The scene is not too terribly long, but it is definitely long enough for Jenny to offer an appropriately fulsome description of Katie's mindset. You'll also notice that Mrs. Smartly puts Katie in her place with the chest poking. Again, Katie and the reader are reminded that while Katie is certainly strong and independent, she's still a kid. She thinks she can take care of herself, but she can't. No one can at that age. Had Julie made Katie invincible, she would not be as compelling. Again, think of Veronica Mars. She could handle virtually any situation that faced her, but every so often things happen that reminded you, and her, that she's not as tough as she thinks she is. Let's see how the chapter ends. And if you tell anyone I said that, I'll be bringing your new sister Trina out here, Mrs. Smartly says. And with the engine choking and hacking, Isla Smartly, director of the Sunny Haven Home for Girls, drives off, leaving me standing in the middle of the drive, more miserable than I've ever been in all my 16 years. I love it. The third chapter ends with what is probably the turning point of the first act. We'll talk about story structure like that at some point, the three-act structure. I love it. You should know it. Tattoo it on your forehead backwards so you can read it in the mirror. you got to know it. That's some another time. But Katie is in her new home now. Her new life is beginning, and she's beginning that new life at an emotional low point. This is great drama, the start of great drama. And I actually want to continue reading the book. Why? There are a few reasons, but mainly because Katie is a compelling character by virtue of the fact that she sometimes, maybe usually, doesn't get what she wants. She's smart and capable, but she can't solve all of her problems. She sometimes has trouble coping with all of those problems. Katie Parker is a well-rounded and interesting character, and it's because Jenny allowed her to be vulnerable, just like a real human being. But what do you think? How do you depict the vulnerability in your protagonist and side characters? Does it sometimes hurt your feelings when you put your protagonist through unfair stress? I can tell you in one of my upcoming novels, I felt so bad for the character because I love her so much and she went through some very sad things. Uh, I hope you enjoy that book. Uh, what's the difference between a strong character and a jerk? One of my vulnerabilities is that I hate asking others for things, but I have to get over that because... By law, I have to ask you to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave comments down below, and follow me on social media. All the links are in the description. You know what? You might like my novel, My I Want Song. The main character, Saren Bennett, is just like Katie, a 16-year-old girl who's very strong, but is also very vulnerable and needs to solve her problems, some of them, through the course of the novel. You might like her. Well, until next time, this is Kenneth Nichols for Great Writer's Steel and Alison Rhodes Books reminding you, books are good.